the Antarctic Treaty was signed in 1959 by 12 countries prohibiting those nations from testing weapons or constructing military bases on the South Polar Continent. It entered into force in 1961 and has since been acceded to by many other nations. The total number of parties to the treaty is now 56, agreeing that only scientific investigations can be conducted with results shared and made freely available. The US and Russia maintain a base of claims, but no new claim or enlargement of an existing claim to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica is permitted while the present treaty is in force. That said, the Islamic Republic of Iran has rejected the treaty and recently announced its own claim to Antarctic territory, insisting that it will build a military base on the South Pole. Navy Chief Rear Commander Admiral Sharham Irani said Tehran has property rights in the South Pole where it is planning to build a naval base declaring that the Aryan nation owns Antarctica and will flex its property rights to not only carry out scientific work, but to raise its flag over a new military installation. Many of our people are wondering if the army will be able to raise the flag of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the South Pole. As the commander of the strategic Navy forces, can you make this promise to our people? Can you promise that we will have a base there? With regard to the South Pole, as you know, the beautiful beaches of Macron connect us to the South Pole. We have property rights there, and they belong to the public. Our plan is to raise the flag there, God willing. It is not only military work, but also scientific work that needs to be carried out. Our scientists are getting ready for a joint operation, encompassing the efforts of all our people, in keeping with the guidelines of our leader, God willing. So we can declare that Admiral Irani promises that we will build a permanent base in the South Pole, God willing, God willing. Ever since the early 20th century, Antarctica has been a point of interest for several world governments and secret societies, including the German National Socialist that sent several expeditions to the South Pole, with its third conducted in 1938, resulting in Germany annexing a part of eastern Antarctica in 1939, claiming what was formerly Norwegian territory known as Queen Maudland and renaming it Neuschwabenland. Most of the territory is covered by the East Antarctic ice sheet and a tall ice wall stretching throughout its coast. But below the surface, there are not only massive caverns melted away from subterranean volcanic vents, but a thriving ecosystem where Germany established a U-boat base called Base 211. While the details surrounding this German outpost remain shrouded in mystery, including a military invasion of Antarctica in 1946 called Operation High Jump, which is still classified, it seems that other nations, such as Russia, are more forthcoming concerning the details of the alleged SS military colony that refused to surrender. 
at the beginning of 1947, yet another expedition by the American explorer Richard Byrd arrived on Antarctic shores. It was a very strange expedition. Unlike his previous three, this one was completely financed by the U.S. Navy. Operation High Jump was its code name. Under the command of Admiral R. Byrd, there was a powerful military squadron, an aircraft carrier, 12 surface ships, one submarine, more than 20 airplanes and helicopters, and about 5,000 people on staff. You will agree, a strange team for a scientific expedition. December 2nd, 1946. Before the start of his expedition, Admiral Byrd at a press conference said, My expedition is military in nature, giving no further details. At the end of January 1947, full-scale aerial reconnaissance began surveying the Antarctic region of Queen Maudland. It all went to plan in the first weeks. Tens of thousands of photos were taken. Suddenly, the inexplicable happened. The six-month expedition terminated after only two months. Fleeing the Antarctica coast, it was a real fast retreat. They lost the destroyer, almost half their carrier-based aircraft, dozens of sailors and officers. The Commission Investigation members of the United States Congress, Admiral Byrd, said the following, in the event of another war, America can be attacked by an enemy that has the ability to fly from pole to pole with incredible speed. What made the Americans flee? In 1945, 18 months before Admiral Byrd's expedition began, two German submarines entered Mar del Plata, port in Argentina, surrendering to authorities. These were no ordinary submarines. They were from the so-called Führer convoy. This was a top secret fleet fulfilling missions. Details have remained a secret till now. The submarine crews were reluctant to cooperate. Even so, the Americans learned a few things. The commander of U-boat U-530 spoke of his involvement in an operation codenamed Valkyrie 2. Two weeks before the war's end, the U-boat U-530 left the quay heading for the shores of Antarctica. On board of the submarine were passengers with faces covered in bandages as well as Third Reich relics. The commander of another U-boat, U-977, Heinz Schaefer, later testified that he followed the same route. It was found that the German submarines repeatedly followed the Antarctic route. But why go there? Antarctica. Recently, huge underground lakes were found, a kilometer deep under the ice. The lake's temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. Located above the water surface are dome-like vaults filled with warm air. It's possible that from these heated lakes, a constant river of warm water flows into the ocean. For thousands of years, these warm rivers may have formed large underground ice tunnels, perfect for the construction of secret bases. From the ocean's edge, any submarine can easily pass under the coastal ice into these tunnels. Here it was, a complete base, immune from storms and polar cold, totally hidden from outsiders and out of the enemy's reach. Many assumed that in case of a defeat in the war, Antarctica would be a safe haven for the elite of the Third Reich. By 1942, transfer of inhabitants to New Swabia had begun, including scientists, engineers, members and representatives of the Nazi party and German state. Certain secret industrial technologies were also transferred from Germany. Post-war, the Americans recruited German scientists to work in the United States, but were shocked to find thousands of highly qualified Third Reich specialists had vanished and weren't listed as dead. Over a hundred submarines had also vanished never to be found. Who did these flying saucers belong to? Could it have been the Nazi Germany? Part 2, Ananerbe. After the war in Nazi secret archives, intriguing photos and drawings were discovered. 
it proved that German scientists were actually engaged in the development of disc-shaped aircraft. At the time, nothing like this existed. How had Nazi scientists managed to make such a technological leap? Ananarbe Society, the most mysterious organization in the Third Reich. Even now, the secret services of leading powers hunt for its secrets. But why? It's simple. This was the only known historical structure engaged in the study of the occult and mysticism to have state funding and support. No organization in the world had at its disposal such a volume of data or had such influence on the development of occult technology as the Ananurbe. The Ananurbe founders were drawn from the highest ranks of the Third Reich. Research on occult knowledge and paranormal phenomena by the Ananurbe received blessings from SS Reichsführer Himmler, who not only acted on his own initiative but also with instructions from Adolf Hitler. Officially, the society was founded in 1935 and was intended to explore the historical roots of the German nation. Ananurbe, when translated, means legacy of the ancestors. However, the society's scope of interest was broader than ancient German history study. Third Reich leaders understood an army size wasn't necessary to win future wars. Therefore, they adopted the so-called concept of qualitative superiority. Therefore, one can win a war with relatively low quantitative forces while utilizing high qualitative forces to provide them with qualitative superiority. The Ananurbe brought in specialists in the occult, non-traditional and paranormal knowledge in order to achieve a breakthrough in an area where their opponents would not be competent. Nazi ideology was based on the theory that in the past there was a powerful Earth civilization with access to secrets of the universe. Somewhere, encrypted and scattered, this higher knowledge was preserved. Specifically, they were tasked with reviving the superhuman in Germany. In their role as an ancient Aryan descendants, they were very interested in Atlantis. Their scientists believed it, the Aryan race's native home. Therefore, Germany was the rightful heir to Atlantean technological knowledge. According to the librarian from one of the Postonsky libraries, in March of 1945, he witnessed Soviet troops approaching German territory. The Ananurbi were evacuating a library carrying away 140,000 volumes. The library catalog would be very interesting. It's possible the Ananurbi learned something incredible about Antarctica. They made the study of this continent one of the main Nazi leadership goals. Actually, the SS were after very specific knowledge. Studies were carried out concerning the paranormal abilities of employees of the Ananurbe. The results were recorded on personal files. When the war started, officers with these paranormal abilities, along with others who displayed paranormal skills, were merged into a single Ananurbe department. Unfortunately, there are no records on what this department was working on, or more importantly, what results were achieved. One of the main objectives pursued by the Ananurbe experts was the use of paranormal abilities to contact unknown beings. Part 3. Saucers Secret Thule Society members, the Ananurbe's predecessor, among the selected were two experienced mediums or contactees as we say today. One of them hides under the mysterious name of Sigrun. The other is Maria Orsic from Sagra. She speaks of strange things in a trance state, from a civilization in the Taurus constellation. She receives incredible technical information. This knowledge shocked no one. On the contrary, it attracted huge interest as it concerned the construction of an unusual flying vehicle which could alter the flow of time around it. A step toward the dream of the secret society. A time machine penetrating deep into history. Obtaining the knowledge of ancient high civilizations. It's no surprise concerning the well-known fact, namely most of the staff of the American Antarctic stations are personnel of the United States National Security Agency. 
employees of American military, technical intelligence, electronic intelligence, and central intelligence agency employees. These categories represent the main research personnel on American Antarctic stations. While the Russian documentary was informative, the next clip will tie together some of the loose ends. Jason Rice was a whistleblower and part of the disclosure movement about a decade ago, but is no longer active due to harassment and doxing, endangering his livelihood and family. I lost contact with him, but wish him well and would like to include him in this episode and thank him for his courage and contribution. Um, 1930s Germany. Um, the Germans prior to World War II uh, were very interested in esoteric mysticism as well as a, a wide range of um, alternative views on life and connections and energies. Um, they scoured the entire planet looking for further clues and more information. The Germans decided, okay, well, they're saying that there's some technology down in Antarctica, so we should go down there. So in 1938, 39, they had an expedition down there. The SS New Schwabenland um, was the ship, and they carved out a particular area. And uh, I think you'll see that the area they carved out is in... Queensland, Queen Maud Land area on the, the map there. You'll see those orange pieces are actually mountains. So the, the entire boundary from a defensive, from a military standpoint, is essentially an offset. It gives them some property and protection and some defense and depth from the mountains where they ended up putting Base 211, the first one. Um, so let's go through the timeline a little bit. They departed Antarctica in February 1939, so 1940s. Let's go through a little bit. Um, they started building out and stocking their base in Antarctica so that they would be able to contain, feed, house uh, up to upwards of 300,000 people. Uh, there were thousands involved with it. Most of them were native Germans uh, so that they could keep the information compartmentalized. Again, there's that word. Um, uh, they were able to use the geothermal properties underneath the mountains for their power source initially. Uh, later on, they developed alternative advanced technologies so they wouldn't have to rely solely on geothermal. But it was there. So around 1940, the Germans make their first visit to the moon in the Hanabu One. And uh, the same time period back on Earth was the, the period when the German Navy had commissioned some auxiliary cruisers, which basically are converted civilian ships. One of them was named Penguin, and the other one, surprisingly enough, was named Atlantis. Again, another interesting convenience. So during that time in the war, the cabal was in charge and had resources in which they had loaned Germany money. Uh, Germany was paying back the loans. Um, they had financed them through their rebuilding efforts in the 30s, as well as financing their military expeditions of the early 40s. Uh, what happened is that Germany decided that, hey, you know, we, we really don't need this central bank. We're going to instead start bartering with other countries so that we don't have to use a fiat centralized currency. Well, this of course upset the central banks and the central bankers decided to get other people involved and voila, the world is at war. 1941, the US declares war on Germany. Now, this same time frame was when they were working on building up their base. And so uh, the U-boat activity after 1941, they were able to, well, they're their two auxiliary cruisers had been sunk by that time, but 
they had enough U-boats in which they didn't need any surface ships. So they were using the subsurface ships for transportation to and from their base. They had advanced technologies on their U-boats so that they didn't have to surface. They were also some of the first stealth technology that had ever been released. 1945 through 48, the, um, the Germans start infiltrating the Allies. And their purpose was to get people in place and they started off with you know, at getting people in the military, getting people enlisted, getting people involved in politics so that they could get them deeply embedded into the Allies' governments. Um, the public portions that have been advertised are Operation Paperclip. Um, now, there's a lot of things that happened in 1947. In February, well, starting in November of 46, the U.S. government had sent a flotilla of naval ships down to Antarctica to test Antarctic operations. Now, uh, given the amount of time between the end of World War II and the fact that they had close to 5,000 people down there. I don't buy that. Uh, the information that I'd gotten while I was in the SSP also didn't support that. So February, Operation High Jump ends, and they sail back to the United States, uh, returning to Washington in April. President Truman issues his executive order in March, in which the loyalty of all federal employees would be evaluated by the FBI. This is when that started for all federal employees having to go through background checks to test their evaluation for their lo loyalties. Now, at the time, the McCarthyism was running really hot, so they blamed it on the communists. But what was actually happening is that the Antarctic German infiltrators, that's what they were really after. Now, later that year, Guess what happened in July? There's one that everybody should know. The Roswell event, that's right. Now, um, do you find it uh, highly suspect that the same month that the Roswell event happened is also when the National Security Council and the CIA were created? <laughs> same month. Now, the CIA took over from the uh, operation of State Security OSS, which was handled by the military. After the president enacted the CIA, it was now handled by civilians, which meant that the military was out. And they washed their hands of it, that's right. They were able to uh, get the civilians in there so that the civilians could then control. Um, September of later that year, Majestic 12 was created, again, for dealing with uh, alien uh, politics or alien recovered craft or technologies. Now, when Admiral Byrd left Antarctica, uh, he took a message with him. Uh, now, there are alleged reports that he made a statement to a newspaper about the threat and about uh, an enemy capable of incredible feats. Well, the other message that he took with him was from the Antarctic Germans, in which they were requiring a meeting so that they could negotiate a truce, a ceasefire. Well, the Antarctic Germans needed to have some time so that they could build up their defenses. That's what they wanted to do. They, wa they had a fleet of anti-gravitic craft, but it wasn't enough to take on an entire globe of people or allies that were, would have been aligned against them. So they, were, they wanted some time to build up their forces. And they also knew that the Allies had nothing that could compare to their technologies. This is a good time to interject with a short clip from Vladimir Terzisky, a controversial researcher who made significant contributions to this subject in the 1990s and mysteriously went missing in 2001. Ever since the United States entered the war, it became obvious to anybody who had some international cosmopolitan education in Germany that they would lose the war. To every German plane produced and flown in the air, there were five Allied planes. 
we have seldom been told these statistics that the Germans had less than, I mean, about one five of the planes, uh, probably the ratios of artillery, of tanks, and of other armaments were not much different. I mean, they, they were bound to lose that war. They didn't have the industrial capacity to match the Americans, the British, and the Russians. I mean, they were bound to lose that war. So, they basically decided to lose the European war in order to win the South Polar War. And we see the seal of the first German Antarctic expedition, 1938-39. We see here quietly the uh, oak leaves of the... This is oak, right? Yeah. Yeah. The oak leaves of the Thule Society. It was under the sponsorship of the, the secret uh, patronage of the Thule Society. The Germans were fascinated with uh, the South Pole. The Thule people, when Greenland was uh, still not under ice, there was a tall, blonde, Nordic-looking race that lived there and later moved to the inner of the Earth and still lives there, flying their saucers, much more advanced than their uh, lagging, uh, should I call them, Helga, should I call them retarded brothers on the surface of the planet. And so it has been the secret dream of the Germans on the surface to find and to reunite with their more advanced uh, Aryan brothers uh, from the inner Earth, according to German and secret SS mythology. Much later, photographs appeared in the late 40s of the German colony in the Neuschwabenland from an altitude way above and beyond the altitude of the biggest stratospheric bombers of the time, which was about 10, 12 kilometers. This is an altitude of 60, 70 kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers, basically Earth's orbit. And the speculation is that this is a photograph of the German South Polar colony from a saucer from that height. There were German transport submarines that could hold 5,000 tons, that were 5,000 uh, 5, deadweight tons, which is about two and a half times as much as the standard uh, Allied Liberty class transport ships. The Germans had two and a half times bigger submarines than the Allies were building surface ships. These submarines were so huge they could carry bulk cargo, they could carry personnel, they could carry armaments, anything. They were building them in sections on assembly lines in several dry docks at incredible speed. And uh, from 42 on, about 100 submarines were <coughs> allocated for I mean, quite a sizable number of submarines were allocated for service in the South Pacific, basically uh, the South Polar Colony. Admiral Dönitz and the SS elite decided to start building the last bastion after the fortifications that they were building in the Alps, preparing for a last stand in 44 and 45. They obviously had one more line of defense, which was their South Pole colony. After the war ended, it became clear that about 100 of these submarines mysteriously disappeared. They were never scuttled, bombed, torpedoed, or, 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 or uh, surrendered by their crews. They just disappeared into thin air, a whole fleet of 100 submarines. Some of them resurfaced with skeleton crews of about a dozen men in Argentina after they departed from Kiel and with uh, fully loaded with hundreds of people on board. And little by little the story emerged that the Germans have been cooking uh, something big on the South Pole. This is the key to the South Polar Colony, the German South Polar Colony. With these giant 5,000 ton transport submarines, they could move any number of, of material and people with impunity. Some almost avoid rumors about Hitler being alive. 
combined with our study of the German U-boat research and development, and Admiral Byrd's uh, expeditions, chasing somebody there in 46, 47, clearly show that a lot more is going on the South Pole than the media, the illuminated media here is willing to admit, the party line media. What exactly is going on on the South Pole? Admiral Byrd lost in about two weeks most of his planes and retreated in disgrace and made an unauthorized interview which probably cost him his career in Argentina on his way back quite probably refueling or reloading with supplies in an Argentinian port he had the lack of political insight to make this politically <laughs> incorrect interview saying that I think the next world war will, will, be with an, will be with an adversary that comes from the polar regions and that has the ability to fly unobstructed from pole to pole. Clearly talking about the German South Polar presence and uh, their ability to outfly anything the Americans could confront them with. Hitler didn't want war with England again. Uh, not only that, but uh, when his generals proposed to smash all the Brits there, he said, no, 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 gentlemen, you're missing the big point. We are not fighting, we are not in war with Aryans. We are not, uh, what, we are not in the business of killing Aryans. Hitler was after a lot higher targets, goals of uh, levels that border on the alien presence on the planet and the presence of celestial management structures that go way beyond the terrestrial small-time politics. So December, Operation Windmill was published as a, we're going to make our base down in Antarctica, which in actually actuality what it was is part of the negotiations between the Antarctic Germans and the rest of the planet. Guess what happened in the next year? Operation Mockingbird had its starts. So these all go back to a very busy 1947-1948. Now, Frank Wisner was a member of the CIA and was put in charge of propaganda and the controlling of the media. After what happened with Roswell, they did not want to go through a, another incident like that. So they decided that they would take it on head first. Well, how do you do that? Well, you pay a bunch of people that are employees of mainstream media to do what and when and how and whatever you need them to say. Operation Mockingbird. Now, in 1972, it came out. Oh my gosh, that's, you know, 25 years later. Well, do you really think that it stopped just because it went public? Uh, no, it did not. So in February, Operation Windmill 2 was finished up in which the, the Antarctic Germans reached a ceasefire with the cabal. Now, they had expected a formal treaty to follow. And so what they wanted was, again, to buy some more time. So that, that was what happened in 1948. The ceasefire agreement established the Antarctic Germans as a sovereign nation. Um, their existence was to be kept secret. The reasons for that have to do with the Antarctic Germans were threatening to go public with advanced technologies, and the cabal did not want that to happen because they wanted to maintain control. The other thing that the cabal had going for it at the time was that if the Antarctic Germans had gone public, there is a very strong possibility that the rest of the globe, the personnel, the citizens would have said, you know what? Even if it means nuclear annihilation for us all, let's get rid of those Nazis once and for all. So they kept it secret because the politicians knew that they may not have a choice if it went public. They would be out of their control from the citizens of the planet. Uh, they established their embassies. Um, they have w at least one senior executive and thousands of corporations. Now, what kind of corporations? Now, we're talking about Ivy League schools. We're talking about engineering research schools. We're talking about defense contractors, agriculture, medical research hospitals, banks, 
everything imaginable. They had at least one senior executive, because again, they had 300,000 people to do something with. And their plan was to infiltrate the rest of the planet so that they would have their own people in place. One of the co uh, consolations that they provided to the cabal was that they gave them base theories, not technology, but base theories. So they had to do their own homework. Now, having their own people in place meant that essentially they were giving themselves advanced theories. So no harm, no foul, because they're just giving it to themselves, right? Well, their own people being executives in these companies, uh, the process of um, advancement, uh, well, you know, you've got somebody who has a leg up already because they've got advanced technology knowledge and suddenly they are on a fast track to the CEO uh, or senior executive or any number of other positions. Now, 1948 through 1954, the cabal was stalling for time because they knew that they could not stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Antarctic Germans. Uh, the technology level of the Antarctic Germans was far beyond anything that they could handle. I mean, they tried with a naval task force, and the naval task force was sent packing. So 1949, the USSR fires their first nuclear bomb. Now, there's uh, evidence that shows that the U.S. gave the Soviet Union the plans. Now, my thinking is that they were trying to spread out more information so that they could keep the Antarctic Germans in check and get more people that are standing up against you then you have a better chance of coming out ahead. Uh, the Chinese communists take control that year. 1950, the Korean War starts. Hey, we can't go to a treaty because we're fighting a war. Please give us a break. 1950 to 1954, McCarthy's Red Scare. Again, the US government was searching for the moles and the spies from the Antarctic Germans. Now, one of the things that they uh, provided as a good faith, at least that's what they called, the cabal provided the London Debt Agreement in which all of Germany's, now conventional Germany, not Antarctic Germany, the Antarctic Germans still had a connection and a love for their homeland. So the cabal took advantage of that and said, okay, look, give us some more time and we will forgive all the war debt before and after World War II. So this goes back to World War I. Now, we think that the United States debt of, what, 22 trillion is high? How about a thousand trillion that they forgave in equivalent modern dollars? A thousand trillion dollars, free and clear. That's what they gave to Germany. Um, so they stepped up their pressure on the cabal. UFO sightings blossomed, exploded during that time frame. There were military pilots that gave testimony about a UFO craft that would shadow them, that the pilot would give them the finger and then fly off, and that the pilot looked humanoid. Uh, there were mass sightings over D.C. There were mass sightings over New York City. I believe that was an Andromeda class, the one over New York City, and we'll see that in just a second. Now, the final straw that the Antarctic Germans used to bring the cabal to the table was they did a nuclear demonstration strike on a heavy cruiser, coincidentally, on its way back from Bikini Atoll during the U.S.'s nuclear testing, the, the Antarctic Germans exploded a nuclear weapon close enough to affect the heavy cruiser from the EMP. Now, it wasn't close enough that it burned it up. It didn't do that. They, they just wanted to disable it. They wanted to get the United States' attention. Now, of course they did, as it took them 12 hours to get the ship moving again and then they limped back to Hawaii. But 
the Antarctic Germans took it a step further because they knew that the U.S. government would probably say, hey, you know, there's a chance that, you know, those Navy personnel were too close to Bikini Atoll and that that was the explosion that knocked out the power and all the electronics and electrical systems on the heavy cruiser. Uh, the Antarctic Germans weren't taking any risk. So they had filmed the entire operation and sent boxes of these films to pretty much every leader in the, the world so that there was no question that number one, they had nukes, they were willing to use them, and their requests was they wanted to meet to come up with a formalized treaty. Well, that pretty much did it. So 55 through 59 was when the Antarctic treaty negotiations began. Now, Antarctica, uh, I imagine that everybody here has read or heard some things about Antarctica. Uh, I mean, it's about the size of the United States. It has every uh, natural resource from oil and coal to uranium to gold and silver. Now, has there been another spot on the planet that corporations wouldn't go into to drill for oil? Think about the depths that they would go to in the ocean or the fracking or the links that they will go to. Well, why didn't they do it in Antarctica? It's got all these resources. Well, it's because of the Antarctic Treaty. There were two components to the Antarctic Treaty. There was a public version and then there was a classified version. Operation Deep Freeze 1 and 2 uh, was the operation in which the cabal had built and established their base in Antarctica and it also allowed for them to go through the negotiations with the Antarctic Germans. Uh, this time was also when the Antarctic Germans continued their political espionage because they, they wanted to infiltrate every country, not just one, but every country every major corporation, every major organization on the planet. That was how they were going to run their things, and that's how they were able to gain control over technology. So 1959 was the year that the Antarctic Treaty was enacted. Now, what did the Antarctic Treaty, the classified portion, what did it do? Well, it granted the Antarctic Germans about 150,000 personnel from the rest of the world. Now, what does that mean? They were going to pick them up from a place and time of their choosing. They had assured the rest of the leaders of the world that they would pay them and take care of them and feed and house them and give them fair medical treatment and anything that they needed. Give them the opportunity to become German citizens if they so chose at the end of five years. If they didn't, oh well, okay, they would send them back home. That didn't happen. Surprise. Um, also, as part of the Antarctic Treaty, is that they had at least one Antarctic German on the governing board of directors. So not only do they have senior executives, at least one, the larger corporations had five to ten, but they've got now their own people on the board of directors. And thousands of worldwide corporations, universities, medical research facilities, uh, banks, financial institutions, um, you name it. The other portion of their plan was to have at least one executive, uh, one, one of their citizens on the executive branch of every government on the planet, at least one. The United States had multiple civilians from the Antarctic Germans within the government. Now, uh, again, their society was to remain classified uh, they didn't want it coming out. They didn't want the world ganging up on them and the cabal would lose their power and control if that happened. So it was a win-win for both of them. Um, the AG stopped and ceased their overflights and their shadows, their shadowing of uh, both civilian and military aircraft. Through the 60s, the cabal and the Antarctic Germans continued their cat and mouse game. Um, they, the Western the United States effort to put a man on the moon was an opportunity for siphoning off uh, millions of dollars to invest it into black projects. They used the Antarctic Germans, their embedded citizens, to great effect because 
if they had a technology that turned out, well, this has a lot of promise, and this may be something that would actually work in a military or civilian uh, field. Well, they used their citizens both in the government and in the corporations to either close the project down publicly and take it black or to transfer it completely. So that's why you end up seeing, looking through the records in a Google search, a lot of technologies that just poof, disappeared during the 60s. Well, this is why. Um, the AG and the Cabal both continue to work on their mind control programs. And this includes technology as well as pharmaceuticals during the 60s. Now, keep in mind that the World War II Germans, the Third Reich, had pioneered a lot of things and included among them were mind control. And so the scientists and engineers and doctors and technicians that were part of the Antarctic German society, they had and continued their mind control programs. Well, the cabal wasn't going to be turned out, so they started their own, which we can see and hear about now, some of the uh, disclosure that's coming about uh, relating to the use of LSD on prisoners and their trying attempts to do mind control. Well, that's just a scraping the very surface of it. When disclosure happens again, we'll find out the full depth of how deep this particular rabbit hole goes. Now, the 1960s is also when the AG built their new base, New Wurzburg. Uh, that was their second city. Uh, they also were building out their first carrier task group. The AG also expanded further into the solar system. You know, there's so many resources out there uh, that it all it takes is setting up a base and operations and then you can go and find your own small planetoid that has whatever you need. So that's, that's what they were doing. Uh, this is also the time frame in which the Cabal had learned more about some of the threats to Earth from certain alien sectors. Um, any advanced dimensional, scalar, time, advanced physics, uh, the, they, those were the projects that were buried. So let's get into the 70s. Uh, the Cabal are continuing to buy as much time as they can because still they know that, number one, they're infiltrated uh, and there's not much they can do about it. They tried to do something with, with the McCarthy era, but that didn't really work out so well. Um, incidentally, uh, Senator McCarthy died three years after stopping the Red Scare at Bethesda Medical Center, same place that, that uh, the former Secretary of Defense died. The, uh, the 1970s are when the cabal learned that the Antarctic Germans had memory wipe technology. Uh, before then, they hadn't known about it. They reached their targeted self-sustaining worker population for their outlying colonies, their outlying manufacturing facilities, the locations are out in the rest of the solar system. Um, the Antarctic Germans started working on their own time travel. Uh, what they found was that there were problems, temporal interference, if they messed around or tried to monkey with timelines in the past. So this is from the former head of Israel's space program, Haim Ashed, who says that aliens have been in contact with the U.S. and with Israel. Um, what does he refer to the Galactic Federation, Galactic Federation that he says has you know, been in touch with Israel and the U.S.? He also says that Donald Trump was going to reveal yes. their existence, the but verge. then basically got talked out of it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. and look, he's 87 years old. Uh, according to him, he says he has nothing to lose. He's a decorated former Israeli general, former space security chief. He's been awarded a medal three separate times, two secretly, for actions that kept Israel safe. Clearly somebody who was regarded well by that government. Now, what he's saying is kind of crazy. 
Uh, he <laughs> says that the cooperation of there's a secret pact between the U.S. government and the Galactic Federation that the cooperation includes a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. A high ranking and distinguished former Israeli space security chief not only claimed that extraterrestrials exist and President Trump knows about it, but that a galactic federation also exists and is waiting to make official contact. Allegedly, contact has already been established long ago with governments of the world since he claims that the United States already has military personnel in underground bases on Mars. Well, this is quite a story, and it comes from the man who headed Israel's space security program for nearly 30 years. Chaim Eshed is making the extraordinary claim that the United States and Israel have been in contact with a group of aliens for years, not immigrants, but extraterrestrials. He has called them the Galactic Federation of Aliens, and he says President Trump is aware of the existence of these aliens and had been on the verge of revealing their secrets, he claims but was asked not to do so by the Federation in order to prevent what he calls mass hysteria. You know, I'm proud to have that German blood. There's no question about it. Great stuff. Well, the retired general says the US and Israel have kept it from the public because, quotes, humanity isn't ready and the aliens don't want to reveal themselves until humanity can evolve, he says, and understand what space really is. Well, the good news is that he claims an agreement has been reached between the US government and the aliens, a contract to do experiments here. There's also, he says, a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. Now, this former head of a branch of Israel's defense ministry is 87. He was very well respected. He says he's come forward now in the hope that his news will be accepted as true. He notes that if he'd made these claims five years ago, he would have been hospitalized, but now he says, I've got nothing to lose. Well, so far, President Trump has not tweeted about this, though remember a year ago, he did set up the Space Force as the fifth branch of the US Armed Forces. Well, we did ask the White House, the Department of Defense, and Israeli officials to comment. So far, they have not responded to the NBC News request. And I wonder if they ever will. The topic of a secret space program is not new and has been discussed for decades, though only recently being reported on in a serious way by the mainstream media. While the majority of the discussion about a potential galactic federation implies that all of the alleged aliens are a totally separate species from us, if they exist at all. But brave researchers from the time just before the internet era of social media have risked their lives disclosing what they believe had its roots, at least in part, involving events pertaining to World War II. In other words, UFOs are actually real, and apparently so is extraterrestrial life. Now we know. In a normal country, this news would qualify as a bombshell, the story of the millennium. But in our country, it doesn't. So 1980s was also the same time frame that Voyager 1 and 2 were passing the Jupiter-Saturn area. And one of the things that Voyager 1 did for the Cabal was it informed them just how much build-out the Antarctic Germans had, just how much infiltration alien races were making into our solar system. It scared them. Uh, they didn't realize just how much the Antarctic Germans had built out. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? And so they altered their plans for world domination to speed up the timeline. Originally, they were thinking that they would do it over a period of a century or more. Well, they shortened the timeline to make it happen faster. 
Now, the, uh, the reasons how they did that was by um, you create a disease and you create the cure at the same time. You poison the food. You dumb down the education system. You keep promoting a fiat currency system. You com conduct false flags so that the people ask for more security, so that the people are wanting to have a security state. So eventually, that's what they were wanting to do, is to get under a single despotic one world government. Uh, what it turns out that the that was happening through these false flags was they were setting up cabal operations. If you can imagine a, they, they were trying to set up the planet for a cabal-like operation. They didn't want to wait a hundred years or more to reach a single world government. So they sped it up. They made it go faster. That was the reason behind the war and all the losses. So the whole purpose was to speed up the one world government process by uh, the, the techniques that they used. Uh, the 1990s, the moving of the Antarctic Germans of the majority of their civilization and their R&D and their manufacturing off planet now changes them over to the Mars Germans. So just That's my term. The people that I met while deployed just referred to themselves as Germans. So, but this is just my, my terminology for keeping track of it. Mars, a cold, lifeless place, yet just a few meters beneath the surface, a secret underground base hums with activity. American astronauts walk the hallways of this secret base, talking and exchanging research notes with aliens from another planet. This might sound like the opening to a fantasy novel, but according to one of the most credible individuals in the world, it's our present-day reality. In fact, cooperation agreements have already been signed between the US and these aliens, resulting in a research laboratory on Mars itself where American astronauts work side-by-side -side with extraterrestrials. Which brings us back to alleged Antarctic Germans and Iran. Of course, the relationship between Germany and Iran has always been close, leading some to speculate that what is being reported regarding the recent Iranian military interest in Antarctica is only scratching the surface. While it might be a stretch to say that Iran's military interest in Antarctica has anything to do with a German breakaway civilization, even if one still allegedly has a polar presence, a more likely scenario may be in regards to its close Russian ally, which also maintains military bases on both poles with six scientific research stations in Antarctica alone. That said, in December 2023, the Islamic Republic claimed it was building smart cruise missiles for its naval arsenal, which has some Western military and intelligence analysts concerned, given that Russia publicly claims to have the most advanced hypersonic missile systems in the world. While Russia signed the Antarctic Treaty, which became effective in 1961, barring it from expanding its military bases at the South Pole, Iran is not a signatory of the treaty. The rhetoric of a potential military escalation between Russia and the West involving advanced weaponry has also been renewed with the circulation of an alarming scenario put forth by Margarita Simonian editor-in-chief of the Russian state-controlled news broadcaster, RT. The following clip that I'm about to narrate was translated by Russian Media Monitor that provides curated clips broadcast by Russian state media for the purposes of analysis of state-controlled propaganda, as well as the coverage of newsworthy information provided on the shows. Translation and exhibition of this material does not constitute approval or certification as to the validity of the statements made by the highlighted shows. Exercise caution and conduct additional research using trusted news organizations to validate the claims and obtain clarification as needed. We're fighting all of them, mighty and powerful. They're rich and they can still print more dollars for now. This enables them to endlessly fulfill all of their dreams. 
It's so hard because we are fighting all of them. Therefore, for our side, a nuclear ultimatum is becoming inevitable with no alternative. They will not back down until they feel a lot of pain or until they realize they're about to be in a lot of pain. Any second now, for example, until they realize this is imminent, as they say, an imminent, unavoidable, creeping, immediate threat. Until they see it, they won't stop. There will be instructors, long-range missiles, fighter jets, and you name it, as they say. Just name whatever you want, it will be there. We'll be forced to wake up one day, like February 24th. Maybe it will also be February 24th of another year, or maybe some other date, and see that at night our President Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin issued a statement calling things by their names. He said, hold up all this time. You've been waging war against us. Therefore, dear respectable former partners, calling things by their names, you are waging war against us and we are forced to wage war against you with all that it entails. Late Zaranovsky, God rest his soul, demanded that we strike Washington, but we don't have to. We don't have to hammer Washington. One smart man told me something I never realized. I'm not a military expert, I'm just a dumb broad who knows nothing about soccer. This man is a radio electronics engineer. He says, we knew it even back in Soviet times. If we were to conduct a thermonuclear explosion, a nuclear explosion, hundreds of kilometers above, on our own territory, someplace in Siberia, nothing scary would happen on the land. There will be no nuclear winter everyone is afraid of. There won't be horrific radiation that will kill everyone, or cause oncologic issues that will kill within a decade. None of that will happen. What will happen is it will disable all radio electronics, everything digital, all the satellites. This camera with which I am filming right now, the phone lying next to me, we will return to the year 1993. Corded phones, using coins in the phone booth. Let me tell you, we lived amazingly well. I will even be glad. At least I will no longer have to explain to my kids why everyone else has gadgets except for them. I forbid my kids to have gadgets, that's a separate topic. At least that will be a load off. Every time they come back from school and complain, everyone has iPhones and iPads but we don't, then I tell them no one has any. This option is out there and it's the most humane one. This is the most vegetarian of all options. I don't see any other outcome except for something like this, whether I like it or not.
local taste of the great outdoors right in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. Well, tonight, Sky 9's Desmond Shaw takes a look at Lake Balboa Park, which has become a popular destination for many families across the Southland. We'll take a look at this park on the south side of the San Fernando Valley. This is Lake Balboa Park off of Balboa Boulevard, just north of the 101 freeway, part of the massive Sepulveda Flood Basin recreational area. This is on the west end of that complex. So it's about an 80-acre park in total. Of course, the centerpiece is this 27-acre man-made lake that's just about 10 feet deep. Look at this. You are allowed to fish. This is actually a very popular place for fishing because the lake is stocked with rainbow trout in the winter and the springtime, and in the summertime, it's uh, stocked with channel catfish, which I have seen in this lake. It's a very popular place for the Los Angeles waterfowl. You're going to see lots of ducks and geese here. And there's no paddle boarding allowed, but there is paddle boating. You can rent them right down here near the south side. A very cute way to spend the afternoon, very similar to those uh, boats that you can rent in Echo Park Lake. And if you're not interested in the lake, of course, there's barbecue pits, covered patios, great place for a birthday party. There's also trails for biking and jogging. Uh, dogs are allowed on leash, of course. Parking is free, which is great, but do know that the park is open from sunrise until sunset, and they are pretty strict about closing that gate at sundown. I have seen people get their car stuck in here overnight, so just make sure that you leave when the ranger tells you. Take a look at this from Sky 9. I'm Desmond Shaw. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.